Good morning, everyone. Welcome for the pre conference session of uh, organized by Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, jointly with the Family Health Bureau, the Education Training Researcher in Ministry of Health and in Indigenous Medicine, and the World Health Organization, Sri Lanka. The topic of today's uh, webinar is the 2020, the International Year of Nuns and the Midwife, the Health Workforce Development Beyond COVID-19 Pandemic. This uh, session is to share and the experience uh, of the essential maternal and child health services uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, to start the session, I would like to invite Dr. Anoma Jayatilaka, the Medical Officer, Maternal and Reproductive Health the, uh, from WHO. Uh, she will be talking on the global and the regional perspective of the sustaining essential maternal and child health services in COVID-19 and beyond. Over to you, Dr. Anoma Jayatilaka. Sustaining essential MCH services in COVID 19. So, why am I? So, when we are planning this uh, essential health service uh, in the public health objective of COVID 19 response, that we need to understand that all countries are uh, focusing on uh, that slow and stop transmission prevent outbreak and delay spread. That's the one objective of this public health response. Uh, and the second response is provide optimized care for all patients, that is to reduce the case fatality rate and the death. And the third objective is minimize the impact on health system and social services and economic activity. So uh, we are today focusing, I'm focusing on really on the third one, then how you can minimize the impact on health system and all these uh, and the essential services. So um, when we are considering, when we are talking about this, we have to think about these four scenarios for COVID-19 transmission. It's first case, so, um, and in the first step, in the countries, either moving from this left to right, and then right to left. So there are no reported cases, that is no one in the, our region, in the WHO region, that all the countries is having some cases. Then sporadic cases and cluster of cases, and the last stage is community transmission. That is Sri Lanka is in number three. And then even though that the one, the national in one three, that some countries in our region, uh, the subnational level may be in the community transmission. That's like in India, they say that they are not in community transmission, but uh, in a lot of towns and then states are in a community transmission as a country, even though it's not there. So then when you're planning and when you're thinking about services, we need to think about which stage of transmission you are, and then uh, then only the, the services will go. And then um, if you look at about these factors affecting the use of essential health services, and health, health intervention, there are two sides of things that demand for services. Do you, because of this COVID and COVID itself and the mitigation effect, demand for health services will be affected and also supply of health services will be affected. That's why the essential services uh, is important. So if you look at about uh, demand, uh, what are the things in the right hand side, that demand that we know that in the mitigation effect, so this lockdown, the new, new thing on lockdown, curfew, everything, so then the move, movement restriction is happening for the people. So then even a pregnant mother, they cannot, uh, the, the, the movement is limited, limited. then non-availability of transport, migration uh, from cities, that is like in India, that all migrant workers on the way for a long time. So then there are so many reasons, then they, the movements affected. Then because of that, 
their services get affected. And sometimes they lost income. They don't have money. Even not applicable for Sri Lanka because our service is free. But still, that you need some money to go to the health sector. Uh, that, because they lost their income. And then that is the reason uh, that uh, they, they might not come for the health service. And other thing is really then, really very difficult, that concerns about COVID-19 transmission. They have a lot of fear. They think this is like a big terrorist. So it will jump onto the wing and it jump uh, through the wall. And they don't know how it's transmitting. This is a virus. It's transmitting in, in a different way. That So they so scared on that. And then stigma. They think that if I get COVID, I'm, uh, I have done something wrong. This is totally against the public health principle of disease management. And then that is not that person's fault. Even that recently I have seen in the TV and in the electronic media. So the way that interpreting it, that person who came from Kandahar is like culprit. They are not culprit. They got, they got an illness. Like I'm having diabetic, like they got the corona. It's not their fault. And then, so like that stigma, then they want to hide it. And the misinformation. Therefore, they don't want to come to the hospital. And other thing is, they are scared about this hospital. Quality and safety of services. They think that all patients are in the hospitals are COVID. Then because of that, we should not go there. And then we should stay at home as much as possible doing different things. So we, because these right side factors, they, are, they don't come to the services even the services are available. Then the other side is supply side factors. So uh, we'll see what are the supply side factors. Then you start from being health facility capacity taken up by COVID-19 care. So you mean that you have changed the hospital. You have uh, that, chain, that hospital is now looking after only COVID patients. That people they don't know. At the midnight, the pregnant mother can come there if they don't get the correct information. Then the service delivery settings and platforms or SRM tests have been modified, but they don't know. So it's not communicated to them. So that's the one other reason. And then also uh, the redeployment of mobility and mobility of healthcare workers. The healthcare workers are repurposed in somewhere. They were allocated into the some settings and they got ill. Even in the India, uh, 131 medical officers died during this epidemic. So in most of the countries like that, either they got infected, quarantined, no died. And then because of that, and then also their redeployment, they were allocated only to uh, not to look after the RMNCH services, they were allocated to look after the COVID patients. So, and also supply chain problem. So we, we know that supply chain was got affected because of the COVID situation. And then also mitigation effect, you cannot send drugs items, family planning items. So therefore, these things happen. The last Thing that in the blue, we say that in the Ebola epidemic in Africa, we learned this. Indirect mortality was higher than the direct mortality. The Ebola death is less, but that's due to uh, disruption of services was more. I don't know, even in the COVID also, I don't know that what is the situation in Sri Lanka. I think Sri Lanka is not affected like that. In some countries, it's like that. So, <clears throat> so how? How this indirect uh, effect on pandemic that we have to, I'm not talking about the COVID situation. Everyone knows about how to manage COVID. That I'm talking about how this COVID is affecting on other services. You know that uh, when the health, uh, disruption of health services happen in COVID, so then availability of health workers, availability of supplies, demand and access, what I for is getting affected. Then because of that, provision of health services is affected. And utilization of health services is affected. This is the demand, this is provision. So both sides affected. And then you, there is a reduce of coverage of essential health interventions. You know that there are life-saving interventions is important to provide to the patients if they are physically ill or even that antenatal or antenatal mothers or child, children or family planning services or whatever. So because of that, there's increased maternal and child mortality. So this was observed in the Ebola outbreak. So we don't want to happen it in COVID outbreak. So when you do these things, uh, you know that uh, uh, John Hopkins group, 
uh, they published in Lancet in 20, May 2020. So they, they categorized, they estimated additionally. How they estimated? They, they developed some scenarios to modeling. If, if there is a 5% disruption of services and 10% disruption of services and 25% disruption of services due to assumption. And then if you have a baseline that's this much maternal death, you get additional this much of it. This is for a month. If you service disruption for six months, you can get this much of additional death. If service disruption is 12 months in different scenarios, 5%, 10%, 20%, 25%, I'm not going to talk about what is 5%, 25%. That is, you need to understand the principle. If the service disruption is minimum, uh, then what? how many additional days? And then if moderate, how many additional days? And then uh, it's very severe. And how many additional deaths in monthly basis? So the month only the service disruption, then if this much of this, then you get in scenario three worst affected things that all the services got affected, you get additional relative increase of 38% of this, maternal deaths and 34% uh, child deaths and also uh, nutrition status. So this is, this is a, uh, the, you mean the, you need to understand the, the the concept behind that it can happen in any country so then they do further analysis they, they have done if they say that uh, these are the life-saving interventions parental administration of eutrotonic and parental administration of antibiotic parental administration of anticonvulsant for pregnant mothers clean birth environment if they affected coverage of these four interventions, that means the institutional deliveries got affected, there is a 60% additional maternal death. So this is the science behind that. Okay, so then uh, WHO uh, with ministries, they have done in globally, they have done some studies and then uh, this, uh, to assess the service disruption. Then because the, most of the countries, they think uh, our service disruption was not affected. They didn't look at the data. And they say, no, 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 it's functioning. People claim. So when you look at that, you can see that, that 70 countries, this interim analysis, 70 countries, they have uh, responded in this globally. You can see that family planning services was affected as a sixth position. Then you can see antenatal care, how much they got affected. And the six child services and the facility births. So this is the way, this is at the, at the very beginning and June, and then in 90, only the 70 countries globally affected, then so you can see that this COVID epidemic, how much indirect impact was on our RMNCH services. So this is actually about uh, Southeast Asia region. This is interim report. You can see that even Sri Lanka, that there are some modified areas, but not much of red areas because our health service is quite good. And then the mitigation effect also good. But you can see that still there are uh, areas got affected. But this is this is not very really that you don't interpret like a research, but this is like a, somebody's interpretation. Okay. So then, what are these essential health services in a uh, in an emergency in a COVID situation? You need to uh, uh, look after this context specific. But in a in a generically, if you look at so we have to think about the communicable disease control. That if you, if you forget about dengue during the COVID, then the people die due to dengue, not uh, not because of COVID. And then vaccination, if you for, for totally your immunization program, you get that repercussions of that. And then also reproductive health, I already talked about the uh, care during uh, pregnancy and childbirth. If you stop everything, you get a serious Question and I explain about how much additional death can uh, get. And then if you don't look at the vulnerable population, uh, young infant and uh, older adults, so it's again the same thing. And the chronic disease, so I think these things that happen very well in Sri Lanka, I understand, and then diabetic hypertension, then they will die due to complication, not because of the COVID. So I just want to say that, uh, so even uh, if you don't treat for the cancer patient, they will die. So, so then the number of deaths is you, you cannot only look after COVID and stop everything. So then you get an additional death from other areas. So that we need to have a balance. 
Okay. So then what are the aims of this continuing essential health services? So what are our aims on continuing health, uh, essential health services? We have to prevent decrease in utilization of essential health services to prevent additional increase of mortality, morbidity and malnutrition and mental and physical illness. So we have to, we are not going to take it the death to the zero. Some amount of deaths happening every time. But we have to reduce the additional increase due to COVID or COVID mitigation effect. And then also we have to maintain the level of service delivery as close as possible to those prior to the pandemic. So that's the other uh, important thing. And then to end, by doing this thing, we have to ensure continued access and coverage of essential services and for delivering of essential evidence-based intervention. And also adapt strategies to prevent decreasing utilization of essential health services. These are the aim of uh, objectives of this uh, when you are planning an uh, essential health services. So what we have done in the region and the WHO. So when we considering, we understood this and then we have prepared some guidelines uh, from the region that continuing essential sexual reproductive health services from our office, WHO CRO, we did this in jointly with uh, its six partners, UNICEF and UNFPA together, we developed two guidelines and then that is mainly for countries to understand that what are the services and how you should uh, plan this during the pandemic. Uh, and also, WHOHQ also has uh, developed these two guidelines, maintaining of essential health service operational guidance for COVID-19 context. That is, they also, they, first one they released in March, then the, the revised version is 1st June 2020. And also, community-based healthcare, they have again released the guideline on the May 2020. So they explain how, what you have to do to maintain services. So this uh, first June one is really guidance to ensure continuity of essential RMNCH services. It include what we should do in pregnancy, childbirth, breastfeeding, contraception, violence against women, all these areas covered in this, how to maintain. And this document, this community services, how to maintain community services. In details, they have given uh, what are the things that we should uh, do. And the main other thing also, they have released the guideline on how to look after COVID patients, including pregnancy, pregnant and the small children, babies. So if you look at, in, look at this, uh, the maintaining of essential health services, there are 11 points they were talking. When you are uh, delivering the essential health services, you need to have a simplified purpose, design, governance and coordination. This is extremely important. So otherwise, what will happen? Emergency people is managing the COVID and RMNCHs, people, uh, program managers managing RMNCH. If they don't talk to each other, so then it will be a problem. Because the mitigation effects, whatever they talk about COVID management, uh, uh, does not convey into the RMNC staff. They say that important is that to have a uh, coordinating body that uh, uh, representing RMNCH also. And there also mechanism to complement response and protocol that we have to that I talked about already. And then we have to prioritize essential health services. In each country it's different. So what are the essential health services under maternal care? I think I know that uh, Dr. Sumari they did this and then I got the, but they have finalized that what are the ANC services to be prioritized. What are in the interpartum, postpartum? So these things is important that any country, all countries in our region, they have developed this guidance. And then also we need to identify the service delivery settings and platforms. The normal service delivery platform may not working now because of the COVID. Then we have to think about alternative locations, models, community services, outreach, teleconsultation, whatever thing is applicable to the country. So this document has given enough examples how to do and then these things we need to plan. And then also effective patient flow at all levels. So this is extremely important. Why it is most of the time that people start to come and then health workers start to provide the services. There's no proper screening and triage at the entry. Then everyone thinking this person is COVID. Then I should be not providing the services. 
I should ask them to don't come today. So that was happened majority or not. I don't think in Sri Lanka it has happened. But in India, several times, several patients died because of that. Several maternal deaths happened because of that. So they don't know. They were requesting, where is your COVID test? You don't need, everyone cannot have come to the hospital with a COVID test. So then you need to have a triage. And then that's, this is extremely important in every setting how you are going to select this. And then also maintain the population trust to safety meet population needs and control on infection risk. If the people thinking, if you go to this place, I will get COVID. I should not go. Even when I was in India, I was like that. So I want to get done the COVID test for travel, but I'm so scared to go to the clinic in India because the, I knew that in one COVID clinic, all 30 people got infected. So that means they don't know how to, what are the infection control measures. So then I, I don't have trust to go there. So, so that we need to gain that trust. And then, mm, mm, then you have to fund the public and remove financial barriers. If, if somebody has to pay for anything and then if they lost their job, now they don't have, well, it's not applicable to Sri Lanka, but we have to think about that. Then we have to strengthen the communication strategies. You have to say, if you re-modify the service delivery platform, there are ways to inform the pregnant mothers or the babies or who are coming for the immunization. We are very lucky. We are having our public health arm. We can send any message within 24 hours to 48 hours to the, our target group. But most of the countries, they don't have this. And then, most important thing, we have to monitor the health service. If you don't monitor so what's happening, you don't know whether institutional deliveries has gone down, whether your antenatal women are sitting in the at home and dying, or whether uh, your children are not coming for your uh, uh, the clinics. For that, you have to do the very vigilant monitoring system. And also, as much as possible, last one is use the digital platform. So whatever, now we are in the digital world that uh, because of this COVID, there are good things also happen. And then, uh, so today we are talking for a lot of people, but only a few people sitting here. But like that, so that we can use a lot of digital platform, even for antenatal counseling, family planning counseling. So this is again an area we have to think. So this book mentioned everything in detail, how you should plan your essential health services. Then somebody will think about, now we, are, we don't have COVID. But we always need to think, COVID is, we have to live with COVID. So then, second one, third one, yes, any woman can come. Because if you look at the India, it's our nearest country, 35,000 cases every day. 35,000 means it has to be multiplied by, I think, two and a half times. Because they don't do testing. <laughs> and then any woman, it can come. And so therefore, we are not totally 100% safe. So even the Tandakadu, when I got down, when I landed here, I feel like I'm so easy now because no, no COVID here. That was my internal brain was analyzed like that, but after few days. So it's, it can happen because it's not somebody's fault. It's that this disease, till you find the vaccine, you have to live with it. Okay. I think something has happened now, it's not moving. Okay. Uh, so uh, then uh, there's an, another guideline on community-based healthcare uh, issued by the WHO. So they and the community health services also can do a lot. Actually, this guideline mainly talking about not the community-based health services, but we are functioning. This is mainly the volunteers and thing, but it's applicable to us also. And then we can we have to reorganize community health services in a COVID situation to optimally function it. And then we can say that there are steps that I'm not going to talk about everything, but it's very important. But we have to repurpose, we have to look at it, and we have to train them and uh, in this uh, community health services also. So then in this uh, study, what I have presented earlier, uh, what are the countries for telling about? Identify priorities to primary approach for overcoming service disruption. They found that in this only 70 countries sample this, analyzed, they say 
triaging is happen at the service delivery point. Service disruption is mean. Screening and triaging is not happening. Then the health workers are scared and the people are scared. They are not like to come. And it's true, even though I'm knowing that everything, I got some medical illness when I was in India, but I didn't go anywhere. So I called Sri Lanka and got the medicine and then because I am so scared to go. Because triage is not happening and then you can get illness from there. So this is very, very important. So they say that if you really um, plan this properly, then service disruption is minimal. And also they say that supply chain problem and the task shifting, role delegation and uh, redirection of patient to alternate healthcare facilities. These were the main reasons why uh, the service disruption was happened. So then when you are uh, planning things that please look into what are the reasons in uh, our countries uh, uh, when you want to uh, establish the services. So, so how do you address the service disruption? So when you want to address the service disruption, you have to first understand what, are, what assess the service disruption. If you don't know, what level of service disruption you are having. So you cannot uh, uh, plan anything. For that, what you have to do? You have to review your data. So we can review your, our data and then see whether is there any service disruption. But this is uh, extremely important to look at your data and see. And then also that you can, if you have your own data, then you know your service disruption is 5% or 10% or 2%, then you can model, you can put into the model and see that how much additional did we can expect. So that is a way of assessing it. I'll show you something. After these things, what we are planning. So then what we have to map, what happened well and what happened not well. So that is very important. So you have to, it, it could have happened everything in the circular or guideline. But implementation is extremely difficult. And then I know in the example of India, their, their guidelines are like a whole, uh, like very good guidelines. They released in 50, 50, 50, but nothing implemented. So, uh, so then when you have like a, uh, you have to uh, you do something and discuss with stakeholders and having that mapping, negative and positive things, what happened during this period. And also then you collating everything and look at these things through the policy dialogue. What are the areas you need to change the policy? What are the areas you need to change the strategies? If you look at like this, then if the next second one comes or third one comes or any service disruption comes, any, any other virus things comes, then we are very sure what we should do. So this is actually uh, how you should uh, the function in how you should address the service disruption. In our region, we are working in five countries seriously, severely affected on this model. And there we are helping uh, with a little bit of money. We don't have much money, but we'll give the tech technical assistance and then uh, mapping and then also uh, identify what went good and what went wrong. And then also we want to do the uh, policy dialogue with the uh, policy makers and then uh, have a implementation plan uh, to uh, minimize the service disruption effects. So look at this, this is Bangladesh example. So Bangladesh having, is having DHIS2 and then they analyze their data uh, in ANC, antenatal care and the institutional deliveries. They look at the March and April data compared to the March and April data in 2019. So you can see the drop how much they have compared to March 2019, how much care was dropped. And then it's reduction if you calculated any sort of reduction is 41%. So when you look at this data only, you can understand this. If you don't look at, you don't know, you think that you assume that. And then uh, its disruption has not happened. And then also institutional delivery, they have 31% so this is the, that's why I, I want to say that it's extremely important to look at your data. And this is again, a, uh, this is South Africa, this kind of data in the right side. You can see that how much uh, 
in 2018-19 and then 2020 how it dropped. And the oral contraceptive has increased because people does not have anything. Then they started the oral contraceptive because the refresh rate is high. With everyone's refresh rate is not high. So then after that only you get the adverse effect of all increased maternal mortality and child mortality because of the family planning drop of family planning. So this is ANC services, how it dropped in 2020 compared to 2019. So this is extremely important. Continuous monitoring is very important uh, on essential health services uh, uh, to see whether the service disruption. So at last, so we have to learn to live with this COVID-19. So no doubt. Whatever the waves come, one way, second one, third one, or fourth one, we never know. So virus is cannot eliminate. So therefore, just continue essential health services in new normal without service disruption. So that's my last message. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anoma Jayatilaka. A uh, few announcements uh, before we uh, move on with the session. Uh, we will leave all the questions at the end of the session. We have a discussion forum uh, at the end of this all five speakers and also I would like to kindly request to all the speakers to limit your uh, discussion uh, the presentation at least 14 minutes uh, because we have to have uh, some time for, for the discussions and also for the all the participants I would like to request if you have questions please send it on the chat option on the webinar and also there is a raised hand option in the Zoom at the end of the, uh, this five presentation we, uh, during the discussion, uh, we can uh, give the questions to the uh, expert panel. So along with that, we will move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Chitramani De Silva, Director, Maternal and Child Health, Family Health Bureau, Ministry of Health. She will be talking about improving quality of medical services in reproductive, maternal, new, uh, new birth, child and adolescent health care during COVID-19 outbreak and beyond the lessons learned and the key actions for Sri Lanka. Over to you, Dr. Nsitramanisi. Good morning to all of you. So I take this opportunity to thank the SNMA and the World Health Organization for organizing this uh, pre conference symposium. Uh, so I will be talking about the improving quality of services in RM and CH care during COVID-19 outbreak and beyond. And I will be focusing on the lessons learned and the key actions. So I think uh, here we are celebrating the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife. So 2020 was identified as the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife by the World Health Organization uh, to felicitate the performance of the midwife and the nurse and also to give a recognition to their services. So they play uh, a great role in the provision of reproductive, maternal, newborn, child and adolescent health services in our country. So we have this life cycle approach for maternal and child health care. It starts from the care for eligible families or eligible couples then the provision of pre-pregnancy care, the antenatal care when the mother becomes pregnant, during the delivery, the intrapartum or intranatal care, in the postnatal care services are provided, infant and child care, adolescent and youth health, family planning, and other reproductive health services. So in provision of all these services, nurse and the midwife plays a big role. We have the public health nursing arm in the Ministry of Health. They are managers at the medical officers of health help the medical officers of health to implement the MCH services across the health system. So we have our health system, a delivery system. So this is across the home and the community, field level health facilities, the first level health facility and the referral hospital. So each and every setting is equally important to have a comprehensive health service delivery for mothers and the children. So we have the preventive and the curative sector. The both arms are equally important. And at the, high, at the district and the provincial level, we have the district uh, and provincial level managers, the MCH managers and the regional directors and the provincial directors 
who are managing the financial level health system and the public health team and the emergency auxiliary care newborn care team and the curative sector. So all these things are very, very important to safeguard the lives. And what is more important is this teamwork. So the midwife and the nurse plays a major role in achievement of SDG indicators, that is the Sustainable Development Goal indicators in MCH care. So there are several SDG indicators which are available, especially in relation to maternal care, the intrapartum and newborn care, women's health, adolescent health, family planning, child nutrition. So in all these, achieving all these indicators, we have set up the targets for 2030 and all these services are delivered through the team work. So we have these uh, SDG indicators. The community level is the key platform to deliver these essential health services. Frontline services for all the SDG indicators related to family health are delivered by the public health midwife. Tertiary care, which includes nursing and midwifery workforce, also plays an equally important role to address this MCH related impact indicator. So therefore, the role of nurse and the midwife in achieving the SDGs are also important. That was addressed in the International Year of Nurse and Midwives too. So we we'll now move to the COVID response. So during the COVID outbreak, our main, our main aim is to prevent excess maternal and child morbidity and mortality and also to ensure universal access to reproductive maternal and newborn child and adolescent health services for all. COVID pandemic in Sri Lanka and an epidemic also uh, was highly involved in this. Uh, Sri Lanka experienced few clusters of cases with high risk groups in terms of the COVID risk. So we had clusters, and the one cluster is this Bandarana and Purumavanta, then the Antiruga cluster, and then we had the very Madison Navy, Navy base, and finally we had this uh, drug rehabilitation center, Kandakadu, and the Senapura outbreak. So therefore, there were clusters which actually created a lot of uh, threat to the health system. Then we had high risk groups like tourist guides, the overseas arrivals, so they are at a high risk, and also even the uh, the health staff is considered to be high risk, but anyway, they take always all the precautions. So measures to reduce COVID transmission. So there were a lot of government, the health system, uh, I think did a lot of interventions for that with the uh, government inputs. Population level mobile restrictions were done, curfew, drop down areas, right? Then the individual level restrictions like self quarantine or central quarantine. Uh, in centers. Uh, we look at the midwifery and nursing. They played a major role in the COVID response. So at the first contact level, at the hospital and also at the community level, they played a bigger role. And also continuity of field RMNCH care. The public health midwife is the grassroots health worker who are visiting the households who are affected. So therefore, the continuity of the field services were mainly done by the public health midwife under the guidance and supervision of the supervisory officers and the medical officers of health. Community and public awareness uh, is another key action that they have taken over. And also when you look at the infection control measures, especially the infection control nurse who is in the hospital played a major role in a lot of COVID related activities like for in the yeah, institution infection control measures within the organization, public awareness, patient awareness, and also even taking samples. So like that, there were a lot of involvement by the infection control nurse in COVID outbreak response. If you look at the need for RMNCH services in the pandemic. So there are four aspects that we have to consider. One is the care for COVID patients. So we need to provide care for the positive cases. Care for quarantine and in lockdown areas, and also the routine care with limited accessibility to services, and also how to work in the new normal phase. So those four areas have to be addressed in this pandemic. So we always, from the Family Health Bureau, we give the technical guidance and the direction. 
new interim guidelines on MCH care for preventive and curative health staff was given on a regular basis through circular instructions by the Director General of Health Services. Guidelines on school preparedness, preschool settings, vocational training institutes like that. There were a lot of information given. Then we had regular virtual meetings with all our district MCH managers, CCPs, and the medical officers of health. Guidance at the hospital directors and the regional directors meeting, which was coordinated by the Director General of Health Services. So those are virtual meetings. And also we did supervisory visits to the hospitals and also regional directors divisions. When you look at the care unit for pregnant and the postpartum women and the newborn with COVID infection, so we had to identify designated hospitals for the infected. So we identified the Muleria or the Colombo East uh, base hospital as the, as the hospital to treat the infected cases, the pregnant mothers and the newborns. And designated units have to be identified or designated hospitals have to be identified for management of the suspected cases. So we had nearly about 70 to 18 such hospitals in the country. In all these hospitals, a designated unit was established to care for pregnant mothers, even if they come for emergency delivery. Specialized medical care including ICU facilities, especially for the newborn ICU. I think the picture shows the newborn ICU, which was, uh, which was established in Uleria Hospital during the outbreak. And we identified the Nehru uh, Fernando Teaching Hospital as the, to manage the suspected cases of pregnant mothers of Western Province. And also we prepared technical guidelines on the case management, especially for the newborn and the pregnant mothers. Then uh, caring for quarantine uh, individuals and families. So there were women or the families which were quarantined during the outbreak. So they were sometimes quarantined by the, at homes or maybe at a centers. So the domiciliary care was with precautions. This was supervised by the medical officer of health and the PHMs and the public health nurses and sisters were uh, visiting them based on their needs. Referred to specialist care if necessary and also special arrangements were down in lockdown areas, especially in Atukam and Bandar and Ayakura. Then emergency transport services were made available. Even in the night, 24 7 uh, emergency ambulances were kept in these lockdown areas to transport the pregnant mothers in emergency, especially. Then supply of maternity kits and the hygienic packs to pregnant women and also females in the reproductive age. These are supported by UN agencies and the Family Planning Association of Sri Lanka. Then organized maternal care for mothers in quarantine centers. We coordinated with the regional, uh, with the armed forces and also the regionalized uh, uh, services and provided care for the pregnant mothers who are quarantined in the centers. And also caring for the general public with limited access. We know that the, during the curfew period, we had to reduce or minimize our services. But family planning services were continued as a routine, as Dr. Anama also mentioned. Otherwise, there will be a lot of issues for uh, MCH care. Postpartum care continued throughout. Women received during the first 10 days since childbirth by the public health midwives. Uh, other services, we need limited accessibility, for example, and in a clinic visits were limited. Both modern activities were stopped for some time. Humanization services was uh, stopped during the lockdown period and then it was regained. Regular communication was there with the mothers, with the public health midwives, and the emergers. Community awareness on COVID, important member of the whole health team. So they did a lot of awareness to the community and also extended support to contact tracing and this is epidemiology. <laughs> Setting up new normal in the field and clinic care. So now we are, we, we have uh, reorganized the health, uh, health center, especially the clinic services have been reorganized in some places, right, with these uh, trial centers and in the third, uh, so you can see the uh, trial center at the uh, Gaza Street Hospital, the MCH clinics, so they have the distancing and also the taking a lot of prevention 
prevention control measures. And also they have some have extended the clinic hours and also the limited number of clients per hour by giving appointments. So we mobilize resources for care, especially the supplies for infection control, equipment and supplies for EMNOC care, and also supplies to protect personal hygiene. We have to protect our staff, we have to protect our mothers and children. So we compare the data of 2019, so I just compared the first quarter data of 2020 and the first quarter data of 2019 using RHMIS. You can see there is a decline of the domiciliary care which is provided by the public health midwife when you compare with the last year. So maybe because of the lockdown period and also the curfew periods and also according to our guidelines, all the all this is were minimized to some extent. So therefore, uh, so that you see uh, up to March, this data is available. Now we are defining the data for the second quarter so that we will be able to see whether there's a decline in the second quarter as well. So contribution of the nurse, I think uh, this includes the special trained nursing officers, the public health nursing sisters, right? So they always work in the institutional setting, work with the medical specialist and the medical officer of health. So there are a lot of contribution by the nursing workforce. And also they focus on the infection prevention and the infection control at the institutional level. And also they have to ensure the home care in the new normal setting. We, we have to reorientate our MCH care because of the COVID. So we have to deal with it as an organization, right? So we have to emphasize on infection prevention and control. That's why we are supporting the, all the preventive health staff with the PPE for them to conduct their clinics in a, in a, to protect themselves. Training and guidance have to be continued and we have to use new training modalities. We are now in the process of developing e-training modules to educate our uh, our field staff and also the institutional staff. In addition, we are doing the reviews also now, uh, review meetings also through using virtual uh, methodology. Continuity of health information flow as a data originating point, so this has to continue. High risk approach towards vulnerable communities where we identify the vulnerable communities and provide more care for them and also the workforce, the especially the midwives, have to get in closer to their community and identify these after identify these vulnerable communities. So we contributed, I think, uh, technical contribution in the new normal phase. So we visited to hospitals and also we developed guidelines and get ourselves prepared for the new normal phase. So achievements, we managed to resume to routine field day services within the new normal setting. Mobilize resources for coordinated action and also infrastructure developed to manage mothers and children in future outbreaks. Strength, we had the good support from the ministry leadership, especially from the Director General of Health Services. Continuous communication with provincial district and field health teams. Technical guidance from professional bodies and other relevant focal points like the epidemiological unit. Public health infrastructure and its resilience is a very positive thing acceptance of alternative modes of delivery of services. Now we learned there are alternative modes of delivery that we have to plan for. Gaps and further improvements are necessary in some other aspects, especially linkage with hospital systems in emergency settings. So this needs to be improved. Strengthening of the hospital-based information or the data flow. Inadequate equipment and infrastructure to strengthen hospital-based care. So we have to beg for equipment, uh, to strengthen the MNOC facilities in the hospital, care hospitals. Poor transport facilities for the preventive health staff. That was highlighted at many forums, but still there is no solution for it. So finally, the dedication and the commitment of this entire MCH workforce from the national level, uh, from my staff at the Family Health Bureau, up to the institutional level, the professional colleges, to the grassroots level to safeguard countries, mothers, children, and families during this public health emergency is truly commendable. So we need to thank all of them for their contribution to resume to new normal. 
thank you very much for all uh, who, have, who have been involved with us, especially the, the development partners, uh, the other relevant uh, organizations, provincial and the district health managers, and finally, all the grassroots health workers, the nursing and the medical staff who have contributed for their achievements. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sajitra Our next speaker is Mrs. Asoka Benatna, Director of Nursing Institute of Health. Uh, she'll be talking about addressing the need of capacity development among nurses in the face of pandemic. Over to Mrs. Asoka Benatna. Again, a small reminder to all the participants. If you have questions, please send it to us uh, through Zoom under the chat, chat option. So we will direct it to the, all the resource persons uh, during the discussion time. Very good day for everybody. Let me convey my heartfelt thanks to SLMA as well as WHO for giving this opportunity for nurses. For nurses. Okay. As Dr. Chitramani mentioned, uh, this is the year for nurses and midwives uh, because. Uh, Florence Nightingale is the modern founder of nursing. Uh, WHO has declared 2020 as the International Day of the Nurse and Midwife in honor of the bicentenary of the birth of the founder of modern nursing, Florence Nightingale. Actually, we follow her methods and concepts throughout our uh, practice. And International Council of Nurses uh, is the regulatory body for nurses globally. Uh, the president, Anna Kennedy, mentioned uh, about this pandemic like here. In this year of the nurse and midwife, the eyes of the world are on our profession in a way, but that we could not have anticipated. Nurses are in the spotlight and all around the planet, this tragic pandemic is revealing the irresplaceable work of nursing for all to See, giving meaning to these things, uh, International Council of Nurses declared the theme for nurses, International Nurses Day as nurses, a voice to lead nursing the world uh, to health. Actually, giving a good meaning for this, we were able to serve as very good or very effective care providers throughout this pandemic. Some positives and negatives with this uh, pandemic share the burden of healthcare. They are happy with their contribution. Increase the image of nursing profession. Automatically it has come. Uh, they develop their morals to work continuously and they try to deliver high quality care throughout this pandemic. Now also they are working towards that. Uh, they demonstrated how to improve productivity with sustained high quality, received recognition and acknowledgement of the community, sacrificed their personal life and family. As health warriors, they really take responsibilities with heart and soul. Nursing professionals are central protection in the pandemic because they are the first line contactors for patients. Worldwide nurses have stepped up and step beyond their calling. Some nurses, they stayed in their units uh, continuously for one week. Hospital uh, arrangements, they had to work. They did not think about six hours duty shift. They did, they did not think about 12 hours duty shift. They did not think about 24 hours. Sometimes they continuously worked for more than 72 hours. In, with corona patients. They work in the forefront in managing COVID-19. They are the first contactors. They have to do triage. Uh, then they are the first contactors and 
they did not uh, refuse to uh, work with COVID patients. Nurses work around the clock with limited resources. Uh, that is a very big challenge for them. There are unprecedented levels of overwork in different areas of clinical setting without adequate rest and recuperation or support and assistance, as I mentioned earlier. They did not consider about their mental health and well being. Continuously, they worked and psychologically, they were very badly affected with that. Somehow, they have to accept their own responsibilities and challenges throughout their duty hours. And they are the accountable professionals uh, during 24 hours. Uh, I think all of us have witnessed how Sri Lankan nurses uh, paid their attention towards uh, COVID-19 patients. Sri Lankan nurses are good epitomes during this COVID-19 outbreak. They are working effectively and invented timely needed instruments to come back against this epidemic. I think uh, through social media, all of us have seen how they try to prepare PPEs and others. They did not uh, wait until they receive resources from the Ministry of Health or any other uh, places. They tried to prepare PPEs and whatever they need, they need uh, for care. That's why we can say stars of the pandemic as they gave exemplary courage. They have that. They dedicated. The servants also there. Why we need capacity development among nurses during this COVID-19 pandemic? Actually, this is, uh, this is a biological hazard for nurses and all other healthcare professionals, from consultant up to South Kikares, uh, down to South Kikares, All of us have to face this. This is a hazard. So we have to minimize risk. We have to develop our capacities and we should minimize vulnerability to come back again against this COVID-19. According to ICN Code of Ethics, we have four fundamental responsibilities. Promotion of health, prevention of illnesses, restoration of health, and alleviate from suffering. We cannot separate each from another one. Why? We have to accept the patient as a whole. While providing holistic care, all four responsibilities should be taken upon to care for these, pa these patients. Under these uh, four fundamental responsibilities, we have multiple roles to be played by ourselves during our care. These are the multiple roles that should be carried out by nurses as a direct care provider. This is the main responsibility. This is the main task of nurses all over the world as a direct care provider, as a facilitator, as a coordinator, as a communicator, as an educator, as client advocate, as change agent. Actually, as change agents means always we have to work with patients and we have to change patients' perception, attitudes and beliefs towards health and illnesses. And we have to work with them, not only that, uh, as managers of the board, they have to do more. As a manager, uh, the little uh, up to now, as a research consumer, we play a little bit less role uh, because research culture is not more familiar with our nurses, so we have to develop this. I will take a few examples under as a caregiver. Uh, first four points, preventing exposure to infectious organisms up to practicing infection prevention and control techniques directly related with infection control. So infection control measures and training is about infection control to be taken into consideration among ourselves because nurses are the key figures in hospital care setup. They have to coordinate, they have to collaborate, they have to communicate and they have to work with everybody. Uh, the healthcare staff, Saukita, Sahayaka, attendants and other people, they are the nurses are the people teach them and work with them uh, to achieve organizational goals. 
uh, if we consider about uh, total nursing care, holistic nursing care, we have to do more. Uh, it will take more time if I try to uh, explain those things. I have to deal with the time limitation also. Uh, I will mention another few functions. Collaborate with team to plan for care. Nurses have to work with consultants, the senior registrars, other doctors, and uh, other physiotherapists, and everybody. Uh, we have to work. So uh, they have to collaborate. They have to advocate for health and well being of patients. Monitor patients' health and record signs, administer medications and treatments, operate medical equipment, perform diagnostic tests, and educate patients about management of illnesses. Because this is a strategy, uh, unexpected strategy for Sri Lankans and uh, uh, other people also over the globe. Uh, so uh, they have to play a major role towards this uh, COVID-19. If we consider about uh, uh, another role, nurse as a manager. She has to manage the patient care. She has to manage the unit also. Under this unit management, human resource management is a, a main responsibility. Uh, if we consider about in charge nurse or sister or the person who is in charge for that uh, uh, duty shift, she is the person to manage human resources. That is the most difficult task inside the hospital care setup during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Everybody had uh, unnecessary uh, anxiety. So working with other people is a difficult task, extremely difficult for them. And human resource management and physical environment management also same. Uh, they have to minimize uh, infections. We have to prevent, they have to prevent even infections. They have to follow protocols. So that's it. that is also very important. They have handled medical equipment. As a developing country, we do not have very sophisticated instruments, and we, we cannot uh, discard all those things. Sometimes we, we have reusable things. So uh, uh, during their care, they have to pay attention towards this uh, managing medical equipment also. Managing consumables during these days is also a very difficult task for nurses because limited are very resources. Uh, very uh, resources are very limited, so nurses are the uh, warriors to manage these consumable items also. Then keeping records and reports also. Under this, uh, if I take one example, if ward sister is not available in the ward, the nurse, the nurse who is senior for the uh, shift should take should be taken responsibilities as in charge nurse. So under this, they have to work very hard and uh, we have to consider about clinical governance, all nurses. If you consider what, what is clinical governance, this is about quality, how nurses can ensure and constantly improve the quality of care they deliver through ongoing training, following policies and procedures, routine work and communication, complaints, management, Complaints management, leadership, and improving listening to the patient's experiences. If we, if we consider about capacity development strategies, you can see through this pyramid tools, skills, staffs, and infrastructures, all, all these uh, levels are directly related with patient care. So uh, this, is the, this is one of the best uh, model to follow. Uh, model to improve clinical governance due, uh, among our uh, care, health care services. This is the typical model of clinical governance. Uh, you can see foundation, five foundation stones are there, system awareness, teamwork, communication, ownership and leadership. These are very important. Uh, under these five uh, stones, you can see pillars, clinical effectiveness, risk management effectiveness, patient experiences, communication effectiveness, resource effectiveness, strategic effectiveness, and learning effectiveness. If we can put these pillars together only, we can uh, see good clinical governance among our hospital setup. I will say a few examples under this. System awareness looked at the whole process as well as the parts of whole. Healthcare delivery systems and the relationships among them. 
all nurses should develop their capacities to uh, aware about the system. So we should pay attention towards that. If teamwork is performed successfully, team can treat benefits for themselves, patients, and families. Uh, if we cannot work as a team, nobody can get benefits. If we consider about the healthcare system, without teamwork, nothing will happen. Team consisted with many multiple professionals, and we have to work together to achieve success uh, during our uh, this type of pandemic. So communication, I think we have to pay attention towards this. We listen sometimes because of workload, uh, no time or less time for this. But uh, now we have to pay attention towards those things, being respected, reassurance, clear explanation, being treated as a person, not as a disease. This is highly expected during this COVID-19 because unnecessary fear is among our patients as well as healthcare staff. Ownership. All the healthcare professionals should take ownership uh, through clinical governance. Leadership. That is also important. Situational leadership roles to be taken out by nurses uh, while delivering their care. If we consider about uh, system awareness, under this, all these things are very important. With the teamwork, risk management and effectiveness can, uh, risk management can be achieved by ourselves. Especially uh, during this COVID-19 period, clear risk management policies should be introduced. Incident reporting and acting upon should be initiated. The third point, very important, identify adverse events and near misses. We should learn through these things. Then only we have to develop capacities among nurses to learn through these things. We can learn from our patients also. So uh, we have to make arrangements for that. Provide an opportunity for nurses to see themselves, their service, uh, service as others see them and to identify the issues. Rectify past mistakes, enable services to be put right for the future. Take complaints seriously. And especially we, uh, we should develop these uh, capacities uh, when conflict or when uh, problems occur, we have to resolve these problems within our units, within our hospitals. Nurses are the people to uh, educate the uh, patient and other healthcare staff. That's why communication is very important. As I mentioned earlier, I'm elaborating something here. Clear, simple, effective method to be taught to all people main, uh, to maintain physical distance, maintain hand hygiene, wear face mask, those things are on nurses' hands because they are the people working uh, throughout the 24 hours. Uh, modern technology to be utilized and non-verbal cues also very important while wearing PPEs. Sometimes we cannot communicate among ourselves, uh, so uh, we should develop these things. Ownership, strategic, if, if we consider about strategic effectiveness, we have to assess the current situation. We have to develop clear strategic direction for the future. Formulate, we have formulate a strategic map for how the organization achieves that direction. As I mentioned in uh, that uh, stones, my uh, foundation stones, over that uh, I have mentioned some pillars. According to these pillars, we have to do, do these activities to develop nurses' capacities. Somehow, 
finally, we have to think about learning effectiveness. We have to inculcate the culture of bridge sort analysis during their uh, work hours, after, afterwards also, inside their wards, inside their units, uh, they have to do SWOT analysis. Uh, we should teach them, we have to encourage them, we have to facilitate them how to do SWOT analysis and work accordingly. These are the suggestions. Continuous professional development programs to be initiated. Uh, actually, we are experiencing second waves. Uh, uh, not only that, other viral infections, emerging disease conditions may be there. So, especially we have to do need assessment initially, and we have to formulate, we have to introduce, so we have to initiate short courses for nurses, especially infection regarding infection control, health education, quality assurance, and etc. Staff development program should be initiated in service trainings to be continued throughout the, uh, uh, the service period and we should uh, allow them to be lifelong learners. Some activities to be taken out by ourselves right here, update nurses' knowledge on existing COVID pandemic locally and globally, increase opportunities to apply COVID preventive measures taken by the countries we are successfully handled COVID pandemic. Increase exposure to infection control measures and strategies by providing equal opportunities to every nurse island night. Promote skill based training programs on barrier nursing, PP usage, and situational handling. Strengthen nurses psychologically by appreciating their voluntary participation in caring COVID patients. Provide facilities for the nurses to fulfill their basic needs. Uh, continuous assessment methods to be initiated. Performance appraisals. Uh, actually, we have to uh, we have to consider uh, performance appraisals uh, and uh, to appraise the, themselves. We have to introduce new methods and rewarding system. I am not expecting rewarding means uh, monetary or any other uh, appreciations should be there for their continuous uh, tireless working. These are my paper answers. This year, 2020 to be the year of the nurse and midwife. There is no time like the person to celebrate and be proud of this Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Asoka. So, our next speaker uh, will be Dr. Sudan Samadavira, Deputy Director General, Education, Training and Research, Ministry of Health. He'll be talking about the tools and the technologies for professional development and new normal in the context of nursing and midwifery in Sri Lanka. Over to you, sir. If you have any questions, please send it to us through the chat option on the Zoom. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the Sri Lanka Medical Association and Sri Lanka Show for giving me this opportunity. I'm talking about the tools and technologies for professional development in new normal in the context of nursing and midwifery. The editor of the BM chair, Richard Smith, has expressed his feelings that the Half of what you will learn will be shown to be either dead or out of date within five years of your graduation. The trouble is that nobody can tell you which half uh, that is. 
So therefore, the most important thing is to learn how to learn on your own and continuously learn, daily learn uh, on your own without any depending on others. This uh, the statement is valid today than ever because that has been the rapid changing of the technology, generation of new evidences and the best practices that uh, that. Healthcare workers are experiencing new things daily, so that uh, you have to update your knowledge very continuously. And then this is not only for the medical professionals, that this is applies for every uh, healthcare professionals, healthcare workers uh, throughout the globe. This most of the that the thing is the most of this information today it's freely available. It is uh, usually earlier it's uh, only in the hard copies and textbooks and journals, but now it is freely available and freely accessible, easily accessible uh, uh, throughout the day, 24 hours of the day. Uh, so that uh, only thing is that how you can tap this. We are talking this that uh, uh, in the limelight of that uh, 2020 is the international year of the nurse and the midwife. So that uh, we are uh, focusing on that. That uh, this, uh, uh, this is the how the healthcare workforce training in Sri Lanka, the current situation. Uh, so that uh, here that uh, that the nursing and midwifery training is that uh, in the ministry that uh, we are having the. Uh, the Within the data Ministry of Health, that we are having the structure that the uh, schools of nursing, as well as the post basic school of uh, post basic college of nursing uh, for the nursing education, and also the under the National Institute of Health uh, Sciences, that the, we are having the uh, training for the midwives, and the. This uh, nursing education is that uh, not, only, it's, uh, not only the that nursing and midwifery education is not only the basic education, then there is the in service training, continuous training, as well as the post basic training. And uh, with that, there are a lot of other opportunities that you can have that, that, that improve your knowledge, that improve your capacity. Uh, that's a, for example, this a PubMed webinars. Uh, then I go to uh, webinar, Zoom, uh, and webex. Those forums are there, available, freely available uh, uh, to improve your knowledge. We are talking uh, within the, this global pandemic of COVID-19, how to do this within the new normal life. We know that uh, the toughest case that appeared in 2019, December, just as uh, seven months after that we are talking now. The first case in Sri Lanka is uh, 27th January. Now it is uh, about uh, six months away. And also that there are still that, uh, although that uh, we are having clusters going up and down, that uh, we can't assure that uh, whether tomorrow there will be another big outbreak or not. So within that, that we have to live with this COVID-19 in near future that at least that uh, coming uh, couple of years that we have to uh, that live with this. So with that, that uh, we can, we have to that, uh, that we have to adapt for a new uh, normal life, keeping the physical distance, wearing masks, not having gatherings, uh, like etc. So with this also will affect on the, that the traditional the teaching methods and the traditional learning methods, that is the classroom learning, workshops, or conference and seminars. So with that, what will happen then, how will that, uh, that affect in the uh, continuous professional development? There will be a restriction of the gathering and the restriction of the handling the patients, that it also should be minimized. Not all the many people can handle the same patient at the same time that stigma and the fear associated with the patients. And the, because of that, there will be a limiting of the patient interaction. And also need to the extra precaution for infection prevention and control, restricted access to care, 
that uh, we talked that, that, that other speakers talked about that how that it happens patients will not come to the hospital and uh, also that the healthcare workers will have some more fear about that and the limitation of the physical environment for the learning also that is mainly affecting uh, and there are many more limitations but with that there are opportunities how to overcome this new technologies that internet fast access uh, with 4g and 5g technologies more affordable and accessible it equipment even though that uh, your hand has, uh, that uh, smartphone will work as a computer with full functionality and the tools and technologies available even there during the, this lockdown uh, environment and the increased cap uh, computer literacy not like the, that old generation the new generations are very uh, tech savvy so that uh, with, with that internet and social media they that uh, we are very familiar with these things so these can be used that uh, we can capitalize on these things to uh, do the continuous professional development and the availability of the smartphones at a cheaper price and also that free education initiatives by many agencies like WHO Academy, Open WHO, John Hopkins University uh, training and then COSIA, uh, these things are uh, available. Uh, and what Minister of Health has done, that I am very much thankful to WHO as well as their partners that uh, step in uh, up and uh, coming forward to help Sri Lanka, uh, that the Minister of Health and uh, uh, to uh, improve our technology, that all the technical capacity. That we initiated the Zoom conference and the MS the using Zoom and MS Office and other platform based this teaching sessions for the nursing uh, trainees as a nurse of military trainees. And uh, this is that uh, uh, very much supported by the Directorate of the Health Information in the Ministry. So because of that, it was very easy that we are having a card of uh, uh, medical officers in bioinformatics that we are having now senior registrars and cons at the consultant level. So with these people that we could uh, uh, that uh, introduce this uh, technology or the, these new that, that uh, learn teaching platforms to the uh, students. And the other thing is uh, not unlike that uh, in the past that uh, there's a very high demand from the participants for this uh, team that now they are adapting to these uh, that are platforms and in these methodologies and they are uh, digesting this and uh, they are accepting this as uh, uh, one of the key learning uh, uh, method. This so is how that uh, we propose to upgrade uh, that, uh, to in the future that because that uh, we can make this better and safe and more effective and more efficient to reach more healthcare workers across the country and beyond. We know that within the classroom session, we can uh, that, uh, teach or we can uh, do a session only for a very limited number of people. But with these technologies, we can access uh, that uh, many more people. And the distance learning is not, uh, that, uh, not only for this COVID environment, but uh, it is beyond that. So over the years, that uh, there are many changes in medical education from the traditional training to the modern uh, teaching. Uh, this, uh, that, uh, uh, as I told that uh, this include that uh, shift from the face-to-face -face teaching from the uh, many more other these methodologies like discussions, problem-based learning, self-learning, review and evaluations, uh, students on assignments, research, presentations, student projects, etc. And in addition that uh, there are that uh, in the last few decades that we uh, that I witnessed that uh, uh, information and communication technology has come in forward for this uh, to facilitate this uh, uh, team and the sharing the information and the distance education technologies are uh, that uh, it is that uh, coming up and it is more and more that, uh, uh, that uh, having a place today with these changes that uh, we will be able to improve our uh, nursing and the midwifery uh, professionals and this is the in this uh, model that we know that in the traditional method, just classroom to the uh, uh, listening to a lecture like or to a teaching session will retain what will retain is only a five percent. But with improved these things of the other traditional methods, it will go up to thirty percent. But with other things like uh, uh, new technology using electrolysis and uh, uh, new methodologies, 
that you can have that it more and more uh, that the wider retaining knowledge that means that improving the knowledge and the skills of these people will be much higher with this traditional thing so with that uh, that introducing the restaurants assignment the self learning and the exploring the new uh, knowledge through the internet and uh, do this type of things that uh, will improve the their uh, knowledge capacity and the delivery of the healthcare services to the uh, community the so what we propose to update in the system we need the hardware support we need the software platforms for that with a high speed connectivity and also the troubleshooting uh, uh, should be available uh, throughout the day uh, during the 24 hours time because that uh, we know that uh, not only that uh, when these type of things are available people will use them when it is that uh, they are very freely that uh, they are free for that they are having the free time when it may be that in the middle of the night early in the morning any time uh, so that we are having the experience with that, that online that uh, research methodology training most of the people are getting access very early in the morning or very late in the night and also the training capacity development for the tutors that uh, that uh, teachers that uh, are that the capacity also should be developed that uh, so these things uh, should come and then then going beyond that uh, that uh, that our learning platform should be linked with other networks uh, within the country as well as internationally with this that the governance and the policy framework of our education and the from the country's medical education will uh, be effective and it will that has this uh, components that link to the national vision and the system integration support from the professional colleges and councils that we can invite the colleges and professional colleges and councils to develop the, the learning materials for the nursing professional midwife professional midwives and uh, to upload them and link the, them to this uh, their learning platforms and review monitoring and evaluation should be there and also the perceived benefit uh, for all the concerned uh, should be keep in mind with this the minister of health has already secured the technical and financial assistance as i told earlier with the who and other development partners and it is in the way that all the training schools will be upgraded with the new that uh, new equipment uh, for the distance learning platforms uh, in near future and already that the phase one the, the, the capacity basic training and the in service training that it was there that we want to go beyond that the phase three is the next thing the try for the formal uh, continuous medical education actually it is lacking in all the professionals we are having to a certain extent but it is not uh, methodological and the systematic and sustainable uh, way it is a patchy so that we want to improve that and also the next thing is the establishing knowledge hub and it is that uh, then it is the make it a establishment of a center of excellence of this uh, in the distance education within the minister of health and make it a showcase to the world with that in this uh, within this traditional that uh, uh, that uh, this a model of the health work was trained in the sri lanka there will be adding the new part with that this world health organization and the uh, university systems uh, and the wh academy like this will come up and link to the our traditional that all the all the existing uh, education system and it will uh, uh, enrich our education system and uh, it will uh, uh, take forward to a new era or new uh, new life in the education system uh, which will facilitate uh, all these healthcare professionals to upgrade their knowledge on a continuous manner on a systematic manner and a sustainable manner at the low cost as well as uh, uh, that we will be able to cover larger group of uh, uh, professionals with that so with that that we were that we are having a very large aspiration a large expectation that we will be able to deliver this and also we will think that the that the nursing professionals midwives also medical professionals and all the healthcare professionals will uh, that uh, accept this will receive this and they will entertain with this and that uh, improve their knowledge to have a better 
better country, better healthcare delivery system uh, with in any disaster that we can face. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, with that, uh, we will move on to our last speaker, uh, Ms. Chaturi uh, Vimala Nagan, Manager, Human Resource, Asari Holding Hospitals, uh, PLC. Uh, she will be talking about the new role of human resources in talent management of health workers. Over to you, Ms. Chaturi. If you have any questions, uh, please send it us through the chat option on the Zoom so we can direct it to the resource person. Ayubuwan, distinguished members of the panel, invitees, organizers, and participants. I'm honored and privileged to be here at this forum today, and the objective of my session is to bring a chart perspective in private sector in talent management to this forum. 2020 has been a year full of challenges, uncertainty, and disruption which posed with the novel coronavirus outbreak. During this global pandemic, it brought to the attention more than ever the crucial and invaluable role of healthcare workforce who are working tirelessly in providing patient care and saving lives. It also highlighted the need to scale up and strengthen the medical, nursing and healthcare workforce. In order to meet up with this requirement, we, the HR fraternity, too, have to look at redefining our HR processes in talent management of our workforce. My topic today is new role of human resource in talent management of health workforce. I have given a brief introduction on myself. I'm Chaturi Vimalanagar and I am representing RCD Health here at this forum. Let me take you through talent management. Talent management, this is always mistaken thinking that this is only training and development of staff. Talent management, when we say talent management, it comprises from the point on onboarding to offboarding of an employee. It covers the whole employee life cycle of an employee, which has four pillars in it. As you see, you, have, you can see four pillars on the screen, attract, develop, engage, and inspire. Attract is that the point that you recruit a person and develop takes on developing the individual. Engage and inspire, those two pillars would be looking after the retention part of the employee. Let me take you through each pillars and exactly I have listed down what entails each of these pillars. I will talk about the differences that we did at our city in enhancing these pillars during post pandemic. Creating employer brand, recruitment strategies, advertising, candidate evaluations, credentialing, selection of the right fit to the job. At our city, we've, we've showcasing the strengths and efforts that we take in safeguarding our employees as a responsible employer in terms of employer branding. In recruitment strategies, it's a choice that we make at that point, whether we do hold certain positions or we freeze certain recruitments, uh, what is the way that we manage our cadre, what is the staff utilization that we are planning at. Likewise, you can have different recruitment strategies according to your organization or the hospital. Candidate evaluations and assessment centers 
we've moved on to more of video conferencing, Skype interviews, likewise online methods that to minimize the contact with candidates. Also, we have looked at different ways of selecting candidates, the ways that we have been evaluating to ensure that we keep on par with the guidelines given. Develop. The activities under DEVELOP takes on board we are ensuring that we fill the gap in knowledge, skills, competencies, attitude by using various interventions. From the time of inducting a person until the person gets onto the level that we require them to be, we take on different interventions. In this developed, under this pillar, we have revamped our induction program with COVID awareness sessions and usage of PPEs and awareness sessions on that. And also we have started training people using online techniques. As an example, I can give you, we have done online sessions for our nursing training school. Likewise, we have used Microsoft Teams, Zooms, and these IT softwares for us to enable that facility. Engage. We look at retention of people through these pillars of engage and inspire, the third and the fourth pillars that I spoke about. Here you may see shared vision, communication, forums and committees, continuous improvement projects, surveys and feedback sessions. When we have a shared vision that we have the same direction, at our city, we do have the vision of to be a leading healthcare provider in South Asia with highest quality of clinical standards. So we all strive for the same vision, same direction. Similarly, communication that we need to ensure that all people are on the same page. During this pandemic that we kept on communicating how we go about, what do we do now, what's next, what are our plans. So we ensure that everyone was on the same page. Also that through the committees and the forums and survey feedback sessions, we ensure that the employees are heard and their ideas are valued. How they feel about safety, comfortability, on coming to work, how, how their feelings and all those were captured during the full pandemic period. Inspire. Under Inspire, we look at motivating staff and keeping them inspired. For this, I have mentioned motivational programs, rewards and recognition schemes, welfare initiatives. What we have done new is that we have made certain interventions to reward and recognize them individuals who worked during the pandemic, who came to work, who took extra effort in coming to work, who went that extra mile of coming and serving our patients, we've done certain appreciation programs to appreciate them. Also, during the last few months that we understood that our staff went through a lot of stress and burnout. So we had different types of entertainment programs, we allowed them to have accommodation, we gave psychological counseling, all that were done in order to ensure that they are less stressed and that we facilitate their requirement. In times of disruption, we need to consider the best ways to run the operations and manage workforce. There are three questions that we realized are required in a disruption from HR for us to ask. What skill sets and mindsets that will be needed to continue to operate, grow, and evolve in a time of continuous disruption? What are the skill sets and what is the attitude that our employees should possess at a time of disruption to give the best service? This is what we are looking at the skill sets and mindsets. And also where we will turn for talent, that we need to understand 
where we will have the talent? Do we have it internally with us? Or do we looking at outsourcing? Or are we going on locum basis? We need to decide where we do we get the talent. And also we need to see how do we augment our sources of talent. At a time of disruption, for us to face with that, we need to have the right talent with the organization. For that to augment the sources, we need to see whether are we tying up with the institutes, are we having collaboration with the universities, or do we have service providers in place? Likewise, we need to augment our sources of talent. I have listed out the challenges that we face in handling the post-pandemic situation. Safety and productivity, we have to control the fear and risk of infection. Managing distress and burnout because there would be employees who are working for prolonged working hours and staying away from their homes. Promoting nursing as a career choice. We need to have improved public perception, attractiveness and increased enrollment for nursing. And also investing in healthcare workforce in terms of education and incentives. With the economic crisis and negative PNLs, PNLs of private organizations, it would be a challenge to look at incentivizing them. With all what I spoke, we have developed the roadmap for HR that where we need to head at this point. As a summary, let me take you all through the points that I've listed down. Discover talent supply and contingency plans identification and specialization of skills, job redesign and empowerment, approaches from blanket covers to customization and personalization. Let me just explain here in HR, we had this thing of like having a first blanket cover for all employees. We always try to treat everyone equal. But now we have looked at customization according to the requirement of the organization as well as the need for the employee. Flexibility, where we, you can give flexibility in rosters, in their duty shifts, all that have come into play with this flexibility item. Assurance and stability and health and well-being. In health and well-being, we can look at their emotional safety, job security, using usage of PPEs, providing them with the facilities that they require, all that comes under this health and well-being of the employee. I hope it's clear, the presentation, and if you have any questions, I guess the next round is allowed for that. Thank you so much, and I hope we will be able to stand up together and rise up as a nation beyond this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chasuri. And uh, that concludes our first round. And I would like to invite all the resource persons on stage so we can uh, answer any questions. Uh, give us a few minutes uh, to arrange the stage for the resource persons. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite all the resource person uh, on stage. Thank you. 
Uh, from the audience here. Now, if there are any questions, you all can ask from the expert panel and get your clarifications done. Uh, we'll move on to the questions came uh, through the chat. And uh, it's open questions for the expert panel. And uh, uh, one question is, uh, they are asking, do we have any information regarding the indirect effects of the pandemic uh, on the RMNCAH services in Sri Lanka? Do we have any indirect uh, data uh, effects on the pandemic, on the RN, RMNCAH services? Actually, we have uh, indirect and as well as the direct information also through our information system. Indirect, of course, we get through different sources, maybe from social media, maybe from uh, observed uh, the, the, the newspaper articles and all that. And also we get through the, uh, through, through our, again, the data surveillance system, also we get some data. Uh, so we have found actually, uh, although our coverage indicators have come down during the pandemic because of the limited access to the services during the lockdown period. And also we have seen a slight increase in maternal mortality. That is not because of the COVID infection, but because of the, uh, of the fear and the service disruption in the hospitals and also the COVID fear among our health staff. So those are some contributory factors as well. Slight increase in the maternal mortality during the last uh, three months. In addition to that, the disaster management center of the Minister of Health are continuously monitoring the district level situation and uh, that they are daily or weekly that monitoring and keeping updated that uh, what are the red zones and what are the green zones like that. So that it is at uh, the ministry level the information is available. Thank you. And uh, there's a question from the audience here. Uh, came, uh, do we have any uh, similar models? like uh, the Bangladesh or the John Hopkins model to estimate uh, what is the drop and uh, it is uh, specifically asked from Dr. Anoma. Uh, do we have any model uh, plan, Sri um, These models are international models. And then uh, using the list and uh, list the, 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 the things that they are doing the life saving tool, uh, so any country can apply that. If the John Hopkins uh, uh, University has done even for Sri Lanka estimate. Uh, uh, yeah, it's available. The, uh, the open source that particular article that is in the annexure is available for Sri Lanka, but that based on the our uh, previous DHS. That's why this is not very much valuable uh, because of the our draft DHS system 2016. 2016. No. They used to the trail data, I think public only the trail data. So then when you are applying that modeling, they, they take the DHS data to see whether the disruption. So if you have the, your own data, now you can apply the same model and see that's more valuable than looking at the that uh, model. Yeah, thank you, Madam. And any other questions from the audience? Another question came. Uh, regarding any feedback or review regarding the guidelines and uh, the vocational training services that has been already uh, issued by us and any review or feedback or any data regarding how it is effectively used in the system of the health. Actually, uh, we have already issued all these guidelines, but the thing is still these vocational training institutes or the universities have not yet opened up for the students. So we have reviewed the situation once it is opened up. Schools just open for about few weeks and then again uh, closed down. So we want to review the situation uh, once the, the things are opened up for the public. Thank you. Uh, another, uh, it is actually a request from me. Uh, if you can, uh, Mrs. Asuka, if you can mention few innovations done uh, by the nurses because it will be more appreciating on them and it will be more rewarding because our health staff you can 
we I know that we can we cannot mention everything, but if you can mention few, that would be an encouragement as well as an appreciation. Thank you for the question. Actually, uh, I observed uh, from some hospitals, especially I visited during this uh, pandemic, and I came to know uh, from base hospital and BPM. They have invented the uh, face shields by themselves. Uh, in, uh, in, in National in Institute for Infectious Diseases, IDH Hospital. They have invented eye shields and aprons also within their resource, limited resources. And uh, some nurses, they have invented uh, uh, mattresses without, uh, uh, they can handle that mattress by folding with the remote controller. Uh, that was from Sudan uh, in School of Nursing Culture. And uh, one invention was there from National Hospital Candy, one nursing officer. He has invented uh, uh, two uh, equipment uh, regarding uh, soccer machine and uh, one other. Uh, in New Delhi Hospital, Another one male nurse, he has invented same. Uh, many, many things were there, little by little, they have developed and they have uh, utilized, utilized those things during that period. Thank you. Uh, a final question. Uh, what are the measures that we can take to increase the research culture among the nurses and the medical? Uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, nurses who uh, undergo some courses, especially when they study study for uh, BSc programs and master's programs only, they conduct research. Uh, research culture is not uh, very much uh, initiate, very well initiated and introduced to the nursing uh, profession. So we should uh, encourage them to conduct research and utilize that uh, uh, evidence to upgrade the uh, nursing service. Um, even now, some nurses, they are willing to uh, do research, but uh, some restrictions and some other barriers are there to do that. So if we can facilitate them to do. Many research will conduct by themselves. Now they conduct research only for studies. That is one limitation for us. We have to expand that. You don't mind mention some barriers? Uh, personal barriers as well as some uh, other professional barriers also there. Personal, if we consider about personal barriers with the uh, heavy workload, all nurses cannot conduct research. Uh, professional barriers uh, take in ethical, ethical approval and uh, getting research fund is also very limited. If they are provided with these funds and uh, if, we can, uh, if the government or any other organization can uh, uh, make some uh, do some uh, activities towards that, uh, they will conduct research. Yes, Dr. Well, I think uh, this is a very good uh, thing that uh, even we can support. The country office is here and our front regional office. These days I'm looking after nursing and military, but not for a long time. And uh, so we can start with this pandemic. Uh, even though we don't have like a exactly research, we can write down the best practices. That what she mentioned is that uh, uh, you can identify best practices from hospital and the preventive health sector, and then you can write it down and then publish it. That's the first stage. I feel like that uh, initially, at, at, when you want tomorrow, you can start it. If you give even a small budget that uh, Manjula or myself can fund that. And <laughs> so definitely, I can fund if Manjula cannot fund because I have some money these days. For this type of thing. So then please start with that. Then we'll move into the, the real research a uh, little later, but we'll at least uh, document the best practices. Okay.
Yes, Dr. Sula. Thank you, Dr. Anwama. That, uh, that is a very good uh, that uh, news that uh, Dr. Richard support. Actually, that last year that uh, we had two events from the Minister of Health as well as from the with the patronage of the uh, Director of uh, Nursing. The one thing is the National Health Research Symposium to present the research findings. The second thing is the uh, research symposium for nurses. There's a separate one. So the nurses uh, became and uh, that presented their research findings. So that is an opportunity for them to present, then uh, there is a motivation to do the research. I totally agree with uh, Ms. Ashoka that uh, these barriers that they have, are various, especially the personal barriers with the time constraints, with the family commitments, nurses will not be able to that, uh, dedicate more time for research. But anyway, that, uh, there, that uh, there will be means and ways to overcome these things. And uh, as the education training and research uh, unit of the Ministry of Health, that we are uh, that uh, they are for to support these research uh, endeavors. So we can and also the funding that there is a little that the gap in the funding that the WHO stepping in is a very good thing. And in addition to that National Health Development Fund that uh, give it support for some funding that last year also that we supported several nursing officers uh, to uh, uh, for travel grants for them to go to the other countries and uh, make the presentation, their research findings. So there is a motivation. So National Health Development Fund also can be utilized for this uh, by applying for the research activities. So in the, in the, in the Ministry of Health, at the end, the MRI is having a research fund so that uh, nursing officers can uh, apply for that, for the research. And then uh, there is uh, the opportunity so that uh, we will explore that further. Thank you, sir. Uh, very good news at the end. So I just asked the question and uh, a very good productive results came out. So it's a very good news uh, and it is actually one of the goals of uh, organizing this sort of webinars and uh, forums. Uh, we'll move on to the HR management side. Uh, if you don't mind, mention a few examples in your hospital setup, what sort of inspirational uh, work that you all have done uh, to encourage the employees and uh, the rewarding purposes. Uh, give us some examples if you all have done a uh, few, so it can be utilized by the other hospitals as well. We do have certain programs in place for employee rewards and recognitions, which we have all this time. But during this pandemic, as I explained even in my presentation, that we looked at appreciating people that who went on the extra mile that worked for us. And then in that, we've identified who took, like, because we had certain employees who just left their families and like who came and stayed for 15 days at a stretch, who had small children, all that. and. They stayed in the hospital and worked for us and certain people during curfew, they took a lot of effort in coming to work from far away places and all, all these things. We've taken efforts to take do appreciation programs and we have certain rewards and other mechanics, mechanisms also in place. So these are the inspirational and also continuous motivational programs we do have in place. And we actually give them psychological counseling and financial counseling as well. We tied up with banks to see how best that we can give them some relief during the COVID time. And all, all these efforts were taken in terms of facilitating the employees' motivation. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, that brings uh, to the end of our pre congress uh, workshop on 2020 International Year uh, of the Nurse and the Midwife, uh, the Health uh, Work Development Beyond COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, thank you very much for your kind participation, uh, participation at the Senate Auditorium as well as through Zoom. And thank you very much and have a pleasant day uh, for participation. Thank you. And the refreshments are available outside.